So Dawn's with me today and we're on an outing. It's my birthday weekend. I know. Happy I'm gonna be 55 week this week. Kim. So I'm just like, oh, taking off all weekend and I'm enjoying all this gorgeous l landscape and sunshine at Duke Mansion. Yay. This amazing place for community. And that's our job every day. So we're a nonprofit and part of our mission is to take care of this amazing place. So thanks for coming to visit with us this morning. Um, I'm gonna do a little history in here uh, because as I think I mentioned when we were organizing, you know, we've got some things going on this morning, which is great. Um, but then you'll have a lot of time in the gardens, which I know will be your primary hope uh, with Lindsay, um, who's our amazing garden director. So we'll talk about the gardens a little bit as well. So the house was built in 1915. Y'all are all good at math, as we just demonstrated with the chairs. Um, <laughs> and so you can tell that we've basically had our pretty recently 100th anniversary. And when you're in the gardens, almost everything you're gonna see in the gardens is part of a master plan that began to come into being as part of the 100th anniversary. Before that, we really had a yard. Um, and the different families had done different things with it. We're, we're all in, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, so the different families had done different things. A couple of the things were a part of Mr. Duke's original plan, but mostly we just had a four and a half acre yard much of which was inaccessible. And so the master plan done by a, a local garden designer named Lori Durden um, started to come to being in about 2013, 2014. So most of what you're gonna see is 10 years or younger. And it will not look that way. Um, so that's what we're very proud of. Um, and now, as I said, you're gonna meet Lindsay and her, she's an amazing person who leads the effort for us. But the hope in that master plan is that you'd be able to go across the whole four and a half acres. So it's all connected with the path. The gardens around the house reflect the formality of the architecture. The gardens in the front yard are very different. So you're gonna see that, that sort of instinct for the garden designer. So the house was built in 1915. When it was built, it was a third of the size it is today. Today we are 32,000 square feet on three full floors and a basement larger than any of the floors above. Um, we are all, this is original plaster, these are original parquet floors. Um, when we're in the Grand Hall, that's original Italian marble. We're very lucky that in spite of the fact we were condos for about 10 years, that the footprint of the first and second floor is actually very original. So when the folks made condos, they did a lot with false walls inside of the space and didn't actually corrupt the integrity. So we're standing in the way it was for the families when they lived here. So 1915, a family named the Taylors buy a lot to build a home in what was a brand new subdivision in Charlotte. This was way out of town. We are two miles to the intersection of trade and trial. But this was way out. This was Valentine. This was wherever you can think of. It's way out of town. Um, at this point, Providence Road is a dirt road, and this is a trolley neighborhood. So people in this neighborhood did not, mostly did not have their own cars yet. Um, and that's why the streets in Myers Park do not intersect perpendicularly like for a car. That's why you see the kind of way the weird streets come together. It was so the trolleys. Trolleys didn't need to stop and start. They just need to turn around and keep on going. Um, when you leave today, you'll see little uh, stone houses in Myers Park. Those are trolley waiting stops. So like a bus stop, but for the trolley. And the trolleys ran in Charlotte until 1938. They were electric trolleys and they were part of the Duke Power Company. So part of electrifying the Piedmont was the trolley system. So the Taylors came out here, picked out a lot and built a home. And again, a third of the size. So when you came up the stairs, it's an H. This is the original H. Mr. Duke, our most famous owner, and I'm gonna give you a little history lesson on him, um, made it the size it is today. It's a little bit reflective of who Mr. Duke is, right? This beautiful house is not enough for Mr. Duke. He needed 32,000 square feet. Yeah. Um, everybody does. Well, as, as do we all. <laughs> you know, as do we. You're so right. As do we. Uh, for those interested in architecture, it's colonial revival. Um, the big columns out front are kind of a bit of the that. We're also super lucky. The same architect, a pretty famous Charlotte architect, did the house for the Taylors and the house for the Dukes. So Mr. C.C. Uh, Cannon, C. Snell, that comes later, C.C. Hook. Um, is, and he also, if you have been to the Novant campus, uh, Presbyterian campus, there's a big Belk mansion on the left. That's also a CC book house. So we're very lucky the same architect did all of it, so that's why it hangs together so neatly. 
want to talk a little bit about the development of Myers Park. There are probably three or four historic nuggets I want you to go home with. This is one of them. So Myers Park was designed by a man named John Nolan. John Nolan is kind of considered the father of landscape and neighborhood design in America. Um, he also designed Independence Park, which is over at 7th and Hawthorne. It's just had a redo, um, so it's back to his design. So he was hired to design Myers Park. And he, as we like to say, was not from around here, which is why the street names in Myers Park are not Southern street names. Harvard, Radcliffe, Dartmouth, right? Um, he's from the Northeast. But he got to name the streets because he was the developer of the neighborhood, just like we do today. Uh, and much about what you love in Myers Park is John Nolan's design. The median in the middle with the row of trees. There's a row of trees in each of the yards looking into that median. Today, still, 100 years later, you cannot have a fence or a wall in your front yard in Myers Park because it's supposed to look like parks, just green space and trees. So this, this tree canopy that we associated with this neighborhood was all put in and designed by the person who designed it. So an early design neighborhood. Um, Myers Park and Dilworth were both streetcar neighborhoods. That's how they were designed. So Taylor's come build this house. Mr. Taylor actually works for Mr. Duke and the Power Company. There were a lot of people from Duke Power all in this neighborhood. In fact, the tutor across the street was the Marshall's house. And if you know much about um, electricity in this area, you'll know Marshall's Steam Station. That was named for the man who lived in that house. So a bunch of the Duke folks all lived in this neighborhood. So Mr. Duke is coming at this point to come to Charlotte. He needs a home base, and somehow he buys Mr. Taylor's home. I don't know how that works. Um, my boss doesn't want my house, so, but somehow that would happen. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Duke is the Duke of uh, Duke University. He said that's zero points on the quiz, right? Duke University, Duke Energy, um, and the Duke Endowment, which we're gonna talk about. You might not know as much about the Duke Endowment. Um, he's not the Duke of Duke Manis, uh, but if you wanna learn a great origin story, when you go home tonight, Google Duke Manis. He's got a great, startup story in, uh, from a woman in Greenville, South Carolina. So it's actually a great story. Mr. Duke grew up on a uh, tobacco farm, working on the farm right outside of Durham. So when you go to Durham, all those things named Duke, that's this family that's also here. Um, and he grew up working on the farm. He did not grow up for money at all. And when we fast forward to when he comes to Charlotte, he's now so wealthy, he has a private rail car. He has a mansion on Park Avenue. He has one of the Gilded Age mansions in Rhode Island called Rough Point. He has a 2,000 acre farm in New Jersey. So how do we go from growing up on a tobacco farm to that, right? That's the question. Well, apparently, Mr. Duke was an amazing entrepreneur and marketer, incredible brain, no formal education, but his family started selling tobacco um, post-Civil War, and they started going up and down the railroads and selling tobacco to folks all on the Eastern Seaboard. By the time we're finished, they've made the, the largest tobacco company in the world called American Tobacco Brands. And how'd he do it? Well, again, great marketer. So he bought his competitors. He had a cigarette making machine that was patented that no one else had. So he could make cigarettes faster and he wanted to market his products. And he did that with collector cards, kind of like baseball cards and bubble gum, um, but they were with the tobacco products. And if you go to an antique store anywhere in North Carolina, you can still buy one of them. They're not expensive, there were millions of them. But you could see them, and he had jokes and drawings and witty sayings and poems, and he had photographs of Riz Day ladies. Now, Riz Day ladies in 1890, 1900 are us. Right elbows, necks, ankles. It's not, not terribly exciting. But the idea was that when you went to shop, you'd be like, well, I don't have that card. But so I should stay in the tobacco and the, in the family of brands that the Dukes own. I don't have that one, but I have that one, I don't have that one. So he was making brand loyalty. And this is early on, right? This is when if you needed soap, you just bought soap. You hadn't watched 100 commercials, right? So that's how he builds this thing. Now there's some folks who say that when he dies, he was the fourth richest man in the world. So we're talking about huge wealth, right? Not just the private rail car. And so they build this huge tobacco empire. They're now living in New York City, and they get trust busted by Teddy Roosevelt, who's concerned about the impact of monopoly 
on both the consumer's own economy. So they get a much smaller tobacco company, but a fair amount of cash. And that's when their story comes to Charlotte. Mr. Duke had always had trouble with his feet. He's pigeon-toed as a child, and he's got something going on, maybe gout, something. But a doctor from South Carolina named Dr. Wiley, pause for recognition, <laughs> um, Dr. Wiley comes to New York to check out his feet to help him. And when they're together, Dr. Wiley says, I have met this amazing young engineer named W.S. Lee, and he's got the idea that we can dam the Catawba River and generate hydroelectric power. And if we do that, we can electrify the textile industry. Now, this is only to do the textile industry. This is not residential. This is not to be electric uh, in anything else. But the, the economic idea is we have a great textile industry, but it's being outstripped by everybody who's already electrified. Right? They can make it faster, cheaper, better. And our folks are still on steam. So we need electricity. Well, you know, Mr. Duke listens and says, well, Dr. Riley, that's interesting. You know what? I'm going to chip in $50,000 if you will match me, and let's see if we can make a power company. Now, this is $50,000, maybe 1890, 1900. So anybody who's good at math can tell me what that is today, but it's a lifetime of money for many people. And he's just going to make this investment on this idea. And they do it, and it works. And the first plant that opens is in Great Falls, South Carolina. Um, and that's the first place they generate electricity through water. Y'all probably know that almost every lake in this region is a man-made lake for electrical generation. Lake Norman, Lake Wiley, all of them, even up to Lake James. Um, and so they do it and it works and it electrifies the Piedmont. Textile families who had been well off but not wealthy are suddenly very wealthy and they need improved banking. And now we're sort of mid-century of the 20th century. And for those of us who have been to Charlotte any length of time, we know that banking is what put us on the map to become the metropolis we are. So if you ask an historian or economist, and if you ask us, we're going to tell you that Mr. Duke's electrifying of the Piedmont transformed it economically. And that's why this house matters. It's nice that she's pretty. But all of us know it's not enough to be pretty, right? <laughs> so you have to have a reason to be preserved. You can't just be preserved because you're beautiful. What happened here, in particular, what Mr. Duke here in this house, while he lived here, is why we preserve it today, is to preserve that, that legacy. So that's my little ad for Mr. Duke. That's one of the nuggets I want you to take home. I want to mention one other thing about him, which is he now, so now he's living this wonderful life, comes and goes in his private rail car, only drives Rolls Royces. He wrote a little paper about why the Rolls Royce was the cheapest car to drive. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's, it, it's a, a perspective, a perspective. Um, comes in back and forth, his family shops at Tiffany's, they live in this amazing life. Um, they've accumulated an incredible wealth. And he's getting older, so he's in his late 50s, which in 1924 is a life well lived. And he begins to decide what will happen to his money when he's gone. They've always been philanthropic as a family. They were great Methodists. And he makes a decision that he's going to organize what will happen to his wealth. And he does that in this house. Again, it's not enough to be pretty. What happened here matters. And in this house, in the room that matches this, the solarium across the way, he spent a weekend in December of 1924 with his family, his wife, and his advisors, and they made a map out for what would happen to his wealth. And because, again, Mr. Duke, big brain, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. One of the things, there's a number of things, there's a document that he wrote here that weekend. One of them that I appreciate is all of their investment goes back to North and South Carolina. And basically he says, I want to reinvest where I earn my money. So today the Duke Endowment does not give money outside of North and South Carolina have never done that. And that's amazing, right? Ever, all the other big foundations, yeah. Ford, Carnegie, Pew, this is all the same generation, made a lot of money at the end of the 19th. Think about philanthropy in the 20th. Um, they give everywhere, in, included globally. But nope, only North and South Carolina. And then he said, I want to only give to the things I want to give to. So rural church, they're big Methodists. Child, child care, great choice. Health care, great choice. Um, you know, all those work today, and then higher education. And in higher education, he picked four institutions. So not the concept, but four specific institutions. One of them, <laughs> um, yeah. obviously, 
Jason College, right up the road. I don't know if you read the Charlotte Observer, you will see that they got a $100 million gift recently, 75 million of it from the Duke Endowment to redo their library, and 25 million from a, um, an alum, front page of the Charlotte Observer. Um, Furman University in South Carolina, um, and then this one is the one I admire a lot, uh, Johnson C. Smith University, which is a black university here in Charlotte. So he picked a black university in 1924 to be a permanent recipient of his philanthropy. Now, I'm not saying you know we should march about and say he's Mr. Progressive, but it's pretty forward thinking, if nothing else. Um, he also, when they named Duke University for the family, that was required that wouldn't be accepted. So he had a big brain. He thought differently than maybe some of his peers. So he does that, and he puts about, I think it's like $40 million in the Duke Endowment when he signs it. $40 million in 1924. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, he was right to get his affairs in order because he did die a year later. And so the Duke Endowment in 1925 had about $100 million to start it. Today, they have $3 billion in assets, and all of that is from growth. So there's never been another dollar given to the Duke Endowment. They've just grown that in 100 years, um, and they give away about $200 million every single year in North and South Carolina. And that happened in this house. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Duke had one daughter named Doris. She's a little bit famous, infamous maybe. She sort of had a tabloid life, pre-Kardashian. I hope you enjoyed this tour. I loved this Duke mansion. It was gorgeous. I love the history that it gave. I love all the gorgeous landscapes that are here, the little private gardens, the little fairy garden, all the gorgeous flowers, and I can't imagine what it's going to look like in the summertime. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye, friends.